Lieutenant Colonel Oliver Norris take on this. Colonel, um, you think he's going to unite us? Well, he has not started out reuniting us. I mean, I, the ideas that he's got, I think, uh, are, are certainly different than what we've had over the course of the last four years. Uh, I think his pitch for unity is, quite frankly, phony. Uh, he's failed to stop a Senate trial to convict Donald Trump. And that, quite frankly, shows a lack of leadership, Jesse, and it could well doom him and the Democrats. We're going to know for sure in the next two years whether we get the House and Senate back. Uh, it was a it was a Pablum kind of speech. It certainly was not Reagan-esque, and it certainly wasn't Abraham Lincoln. It wasn't uh, George Washington, quite frankly. It was, by the way, much shorter. Uh, I do point out that uh, Donald Trump is not the very first president to be voted out of office. Uh, the, the precedent was set by the second president of the United States, who did not attend Thomas Jefferson's inaugural, because John Adams left town the night before in a stagecoach, going back to Massachusetts. I look at this, this speech, quite frankly, as Jesse, it's the kind of thing that, that most presidents do. They kind of set a broad agenda. But the very specifics of the things he's already started to do with his executive orders, all the kinds of things he's talked about, I count as very high risk, not just to him, but for our country. Uh, and I, just very quickly in order of, of risk, communist China is the number one adversary that we face in this country. Their military, diplomatic, and economic threats, their overt and covert relationship with the Iranians means that the Iranians are going to get nuclear weapons. And of course, tied to all of that is Hunter Biden. Is he gonna be prosecuted for crimes he may have committed? Certainly sounds like a lot of things that he did not do right, certainly not ethically, and maybe even illegally. Second, he's gonna abandon Israel as the only Middle East democracy and our best regional ally. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and we're very threatened by the communist Chinese relationship with the Iranians on nuclears. That's what's gonna be the biggest threat of all to Israel and to us. You know, you, if they back away from the Abraham Accords and embrace John Kerry's so-called two-state solution, and it sounds like that's, that's coming, and that, that very factor is gonna force the, uh, the Israelis, they're gonna to try to force the Israelis to go back to John Kerry's borders and a withdrawal from the Golan Heights. And even though their Secretary of State advocate says that they're not gonna make the embassy move back to Tel Aviv, there's people already talking about that. Third, the embrace of the disastrous Paris Environmental Accords is gonna wreck the US economy and help China. It's a green bad deal, not a good deal. The ban on exporting coal and it means you're going to export jobs. Uh, if they stop building the Keystone and XL pipeline, uh, that's going to put more people out of work. It's a threat to the American energy independence that Donald Trump achieved. And a, the EPA is going to take charge of American jobs in our economy. Number four, the reversal of Donald Trump's immigration repairs, building the border security wall, abandoning the requirement for refugee status before entering the US and the travel ban for immigration from certain countries like Libya, uh, why would you wanna reverse all that? And finally, that pitch about unity, it's phony. And the failure to stop a Senate trial to convict President Trump shows a lack of leadership. That may well mean, quite frankly, good news for the Republicans, but in the long run, it's a bad news for America. Colonel, what do you take away from Trump's presidency, the good and the bad? What was it to you? Yeah, look, at his greatest le legacy was his anti-communist, anti-terrorist uh, security measures. He rebuilt the U.S. military. He created, and this is so important, and, and the way I put it, I believe is important. Donald Trump created the dignity of work for millions of Americans who in many cases had never had a job before. That's a remarkable achievement. COVID ended all that. The bottom line of it is, if if what Biden and the Congress do, and you know we've heard the speeches up there in the Congress by both the opponents and the, the new regime leadership up there, but if they hold to the programs and the policies that Donald Trump created, America's gonna do okay. But the idea that you're somehow gonna get unity out of prosecuting the president who's no longer in office is, one, well, first of all, unprecedented, and number two, it demonstrates a lack of real leadership on the part of Joe Biden. I can't, I can't see how that's good for him, Jesse. 
Explain to me the Iran-China connection, because it, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, you have the, the you have the Ayatollah, you have the commies in China. Why are they linked at all? I understand they both suck, but what's the link? Well, us. The link is anything that's bad for America, and that's what the Iranians and the and the Chinese are up to. Xi Jinping. You know, I've got. I, I love to hold this book up and show you the face of the guy who is the great danger to all of us. Xi Jinping, the head of the People's Republic of China, Secretary General of the Communist Party, the head of their military and their civilians in a non-democratic society, for an individual, by the way, who does not have term limits. He could be there for the rest of his life. He's going to certainly outlive me. The bottom line of it is the communist Chinese are trying to do is to create another thorn in the side of the United States. When you look at all that they're doing over there, particularly with the economic boost that they're giving to the to the Iranians, Xi Jinping's regime is out to help any way he possibly can to get more help to the Iranians because that will get them the nuclear weapons that they're looking for. Okay, the Israel thing. What can they actually do that's going to hurt us there? Everybody's proud of the steps Donald Trump made. Everyone's proud about the embassy moving. Can they really hurt the advances we made? Is this going to hurt the Israeli people? And how does it hurt us? Well, it hurts us because the Abraham Accords are a remarkable change in the Middle East. I mean, if you, if you really want to take it back, you could go back over a thousand years. Ending the Arab-Israeli disputes is a major, major achievement that this administration made. It was the kind of thing that was completely the opposite of the Obama-Biden regime. When Kerry was out there telling the Israelis they had to cut back to their old pre-1967 borders, give up the Golan, and make sure that there is a, quote, dual, cap dual capital in Jerusalem. Because Donald Trump basically said, we're going to recognize the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. Move the embassy from there, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. What, what they're already talking about in this regime, in the, in the Biden regime, is they're going to tell the Palestinians that their co-capital is going to be East, East Jerusalem. What, what you're trying to do is divide the country against us. And, and, of course, Israeli politics are almost as volatile as ours. Okay. Uh, explain the Democratic Party as best you can in the anti-Israel thing. I guess I never, I guess I never pictured them that way until Obama. And it was so clear how anti-Israel he was. What is that? Where's the connection there? What am I missing? Well, mo most American Jews are, are anti-Zionists. They, in fact, Despite the diaspora all over the planet Earth of Jews who fled that part of the world over the last millennia, the idea of, of a Jewish state is, antip quite frankly, and, and it's, it's the kind of things that many Israeli Jews, excuse me, many American Jews don't support. And so the Democrats have, have basically built 50 years of work on, on that kind of thing, forgetting, of course, that in the midst of the beginning of World War II, when, when Jews were fleeing Europe, a ship, the St. Louis, fled with a, a shipload of Jews on and tried to get to emigrate to the United States initially, then to Canada, even to Cuba, for crying out loud. Everybody turned them around and they went back to Hamburg and most of the people on that ship died in the death camps. That was a democratic administration, I point out. The president, I, who was president when I was born, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We're here with Colonel Oliver North. Colonel, all right, Paris. Why should Americans care about the Paris Climate Accord in a way that's going to affect their lives? I understand on a macro level, but somebody watching at home right now, why do they care whether we're in it, whether we're not in it? What does it do to them? Well, first of all, if you, if you want to pay a lot more for energy and electricity, and apparently that's part of the goal of the Paris Peace Accords, the, the Paris Climate Accords, what you're going to end up with, Jesse, is... Fewer people in the energy business in the United States buying lots and lots of solar panels from communist China and windmills and making sure that you can't export coal. You can't export things that create carbon. Well, guess what? Oil and gas and coal create carbon gases. And so you're going to find tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. I can't, I can't imagine how Joe Manchin from West Virginia can support the idea of rejoining the Paris so-called environmental accords. It just, it makes no sense to me. But part of that whole thing is you're gonna have to do away with gasoline or, or petroleum powered automobiles 
How are you going to fly in a, in a jet without a, a, you know, a solar engine for jets? I mean, think about all the effects of that, th those, those so-called uh, common ground that they're looking for with the Europeans on this. I mean, it gives China an enormous leg up because they're not part of it. Neither, by the way, is Colonel, India, which is a potential close ally. Well, one thing we never talk about anymore is Venezuela. It was in the news for about 15 minutes. Oh, there's a madman down there. There's a dictator. And I know they're a bad actor. I know Iran's involved down there. It's, it's a really bad place. And now we don't, we don't hear about it anymore. Why? Is it a, a, a booming republic now? Well, you got to, our colleagues in the so-called mainstream media, you know, don't, who decide what you and I and the rest of America needs to or wants to know, they decide. You know, you do it not only by censoring people like Donald Trump, taking them off social media, or socially, you know, people like you and me. I mean, how long is it going to be before they come after my podcasts? I look at those kinds of things and say, why aren't they talking about that? Why aren't they reporting on it? It's the same thing. If you want to wait for how Venezuela is affecting things, wait till you see what happens after these convoys start arriving at the border, and apparently the new regime in Washington is going to let them in. You wait and see how many of those are terrorists, how many of those commit crimes, how many of those are people returning to America who've already committed crimes, and how many of them are Venezuelans simply looking to get out from a communist regime. Remember, Donald Trump was a great anti-communist and a great anti-terrorism guy. Where does where does our military go from here? I'm not helpful. I, I saw his new Joe Biden's new defense pick is going to try to root out white supremacy as if that's yeah. that's the biggest thing we're facing right now. Is it this wokeism stuff that's that's plaguing our military? This is only going to get worse now, right? I agree. I, you know, the fact is, the cancel culture is alive and well. When you see members of the of the U.S. Armed Forces being attacked in the media for being on the side of Trump and then telling guys, okay, you're gonna be out there with your M M4s, you're gonna line up, your 25,000 troops lined up, and then a demand inside this new cabal or this new administration, make sure that they don't have their ammunition in those weapons. I mean, when you look at that kind of thing, you gotta to say to yourself, why is that? Do they really fear an internal threat from the armed forces of the United States? I I'm outraged by the thought. Do they? Do you think, or was that all for show? I took that as being them trying to build this narrative of some violent right-wing domestic terrorism thing, but I didn't take them as actually taking that seriously. Do they think there's a bunch of murderous National Guardsmen in D.C. right now? Apparently. I mean, that, what a great insult to the... Most of these guys, by the way, have already served overseas in combat, in combat zones in Afghanistan, Iraq, some in the special operations units inside places like Africa. They've already served their country in harm's way, and now you got people questioning their loyalty to the new president. Outrageous. Colonel Oliver North, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, Jess. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Hey, thanks so much for watching The First on YouTube. If you liked what you saw, go ahead and like and subscribe. You heard me. Like it, subscribe. You'll get a lot more of it and a lot more of me.